okay? Uh, you find things like uh, corculitis on rocks. You can find uh, various types of rhizoans attached to the bracts. There's all types of things, epibionts, that are attached to other fossils. And so you don't necessarily want to clean them off because they might be more important than the bracky pot. Uh, I was at the museum today and there's this box and there's one little tiny bracky pot laying in there. What the heck was this doing here? Well, it had a number on it. That means it's already been cataloged. It just wasn't where it should have been. So I go to the catalog and I look up the number and I thought, that says Isolophus austenic. That's an agroesteroid, but that's, that's a brachiopod. They've got the number wrong or something. And all of a sudden, Donna, they take a look at the brachiopod. And sure enough, on it was a tiny little agroesteroid. That's what that was for. And it was something that you might overlook. And so when you've got to look closely, so you don't want to get too radical with steel tools, limestone, and, and the material that the fossils are made of is relatively small as rocks. Okay, on, on the hardness scale, it's about three. These things are about seven. They scratch things up. So you don't want to get too uh, uh, anxious with tools like this. You don't need them. Again, the only thing you need is some water and a toothbrush. Uh, don't use acids. Most people don't have them available, but a good acid is vinegar. Vinegar will dissolve uh, limestone. It's slow, but it'll do it. The problem is the fossils are made of the same stuff as the material you're trying to get rid of. And so if you dissolve up the rock, you dissolve up the fossil, too. I collect certain kind of microfossils called scalicodonts. And the way you get them out is you dissolve up the rock. And everything dissolves with these microfossils. I lost some really nice crinoids that way. I didn't know they were there. But after, every, after part of the rock dissolved off, there was the impression. And they dissolve faster than the rock. So you have to be very careful. Unless you really know what you're doing, you shouldn't try to do any kind of acid cleaning. Because even if you're cleaning mud off or something like this, and you say, well, I'm just going to you know, brush it off lightly with the acid, you can lose a lot of the little details of the fossil. What might have had a coarse or striated surface now has a smooth surface. Well, it's not supposed to. Okay? But the acid ate it away. So acid cleaning is not recommended. They do make certain kinds of detergents that you can use to clean fossils, supposedly. Uh, most of them are not readily available. Uh, they are available, but it's not something you go you know, down to Walgreens and get some, something like this or kind of produce. And so basically, water and a toothbrush is all you need. Dry them out, arrange them. Um, you know, get these trays too, maybe make friends with the butcher, the Kroger's or something, and ask them for a couple. They might give them to you. I don't know. I've never had to do that. Actually, I got a whole stack of them one time. I was teaching her science, and the kid said, my mom works at Kroger's in the, in the meat counter. I said, can you give me some trays? And he brought me a stack of them about this big. Well, we used a bunch of them in class, but I managed to still have a couple left over. Um, when, I, when they're dry, when everything's dry, I basically arrange the fossils the way I want to catalog them. I catalog everything that I collect. Okay? And what I do is I take clear fingernail polish. Now, I've seen this on fossils down at the museum, too. Uh, I take this and I put a little mark, a little splotch of it, in an uh, inconspicuous place on the fossil or on the rock the fossil's on. The reason is because a lot of things, times when you try to write on limestone, uh, it's so porous that the ink spreads and it makes a mess. You put this down, you get a nice smooth surface to write on. Okay? Then, when it's dry, I number it. Okay? Now, I used to do for years, 
I used it in ink. Straight pen and in Indian ink. I've gone, I don't know how many miles of this I've gone through. Now, I spent a little more money and I get what are called pigment pads. This is also what we use down at the museum. These things come in various, various sizes uh, from 0.1 millimeter to 0.7 millimeters. If you've got a tiny little fossil and you've got that 0.1 millimeter pen, you can write a number on there that you can read. If you use a regular type of pen, you can't do that. But you can put a really small number on there. You might need your lens to see it, but you can put a really tiny number on there and number it. Um, then, after the ink dries, I put another dab of this over the top of it to seal it. It's really neat because this stuff is almost permanent. It's not going to come off. But if you decide someday that you want to change your numbering system, or you want to donate this to somebody and you don't want your number on there, all you need is finger shit nail polish remover or a little bit of acetone, and you wipe it right off. It comes right off. Otherwise, it's permanent. Okay? I put rocks with this in it in acid to dissolve them, to get the microfossils in there. And I got mud in the bottom, and I got a little plastic thing floating around in there with a the number on it. The number is sealed in the plastic. It's like it's laminated in there, and it doesn't come out. So it's, it's permanent as long as you want it to be. Okay? It works very, very well. Um, what kind of number do you put on there? Well, the recommended way that everybody says the number is consecutively. You start out with one, and then two, and three, and so forth. And when I started, that's what I did. And very quickly, I changed my mind. I wanted to do something else. And there's all different kinds of systems. Uh, I see a lot of, again, I work at the museum, volunteer at the museum, and going through the stuff down there, there's all kinds of numbers on, on rocks. <coughs> some rocks, some of the fossils down there have three different numbers on them. Then you've got to figure out which one's the museum number. <laughs> um, I, what I do, I assign each collection that I make in the field a number. Okay, so this is my, this is my current book. This is volume four. I've got three more books, and the last entry in here is 254. So I've made 254 collections. Okay, and then what I do is I letter the fossils that I collect. Okay, now I got 15 of them, they're all the same kind, they're going to get the same number. Okay, but for each different one, they get a letter, A, B, C, D, all the way down. If I got more than the alphabet allows, then I go A, A, B, B, C, C, and so forth, and I do that. That way, what I can do, I can look at a particular collection because I don't keep them by uh, location, I keep them by the type of fossil but I can put all the 254s together and know what I collected on that day at that site. Or I can, I have another thing that I do, I have location numbers. So like on the top of this page it says L96. That's the 96th different location that I collected at. And this is, this is that, it's double A highway. Okay, L96. So I can go and check what numbers I collected at L96, because I keep a master list. And then I can find those out, find everything that was at that site. Uh, this is important when you are collecting that you do keep records. Maybe not, as, maybe not the way I do it, but to keep records, to number the things. If you don't number the fossils, at least number the container that they're in. You get bags, number the bag or put a label in the bag that has the number on it for those fossils. Because if you find something that's really rare, or you find something that's really scientifically important, and you don't know where you found it, it's not worth anything. It's not worth anything. Without location data, the best fossils, I mean, we've got, we've got things in the museum that the best you know, sponge that we have down there. It says Cincinnati, Ohio. 
well, how many different layers of rock are there in the Cincinnati, Ohio area? Okay? Uh, which one did this come out of? Where was it found? Right? So you'd have to have a little more than that. What my book here tells me is basically where it's from. My master list has more information about that site. 